Then second panelist, uh, Mutiaba Farouk Wali Ul Azir from the Education Center and Kampala International University, Tanzania, is going to talk about influence of traditional African societies on conflict resolution in Buganda Kingdom in Uganda. Yeah, I'm talking about the influence of traditional African societies on conflict resolutions in Buganda Kingdom. That kingdom from the kingdom of Buganda itself, it's very famous. Most of the people, when they talk about Uganda, and then they talk about Buganda, they confuse the two. It is famous, I think, because uh, when the Europeans came, it was a very big kingdom. And they couldn't say Buganda. So we were saying, Uganda, Uganda. So people confused the two. And even our neighbors in Tanzania, uh, they say, Muganda, meaning Ugandan. Yeah. OK. My name is Farouk. I'm from Wadula Astral Education Center and uh, Kampala International University. Like I said, that Buganda Kingdom is very famous. In fact, it is like it swallows almost all those other kingdoms when it comes to being highlighted in the day-to-day -day activities. It is made up of the people called Uganda. Or if you are there, you say Baganda, meaning a big group of Uganda people. And like you see, Conflicts have always been part of human society, and mechanisms to resolve them have often tended to reflect the level of political organization in that particular society. Uh, we can go ahead and say that the milestone in the promotion of solving conflict resolution in Buganda for peace in cultural institutions has been the legal provision of operations of cultural leaders since 1995 constitution. What we must remember is in uh, 1993, Buganda Kingdom got back its powers as a kingdom, having uh, been put off course during the some crisis. There is a crisis that took place and the, all the power Buganda had on its people, on its territory, was snatched. Yeah. And when it regained, in fact, there was a coronation whereby the power of the king, or we call the Kabaka, was uh, restored. That is in 1993. Getting to the point, Several negotiations for peace building have been held, especially for Buganda Kingdom, to discuss issues affecting them as Uganda and the course of solving conflicts. Like I said, in 1993, before the coronation or the restoration of the powers of the Kabaka or the king of Buganda, there were negotiations there were some crises, there were a lot of turmoil amongst the cultural leaders themselves. And this calls attention for other kingdoms to begin following the footsteps of Buganda Kingdom to regain its administrative uh, powers as far as the territory is concerned. Now, in those negotiations, we had uh, different NGOs that were coming in to do some push. Why are they coming in? If these uh, events that are not all that palatable, 
find a way into the nerves of the people. There is a way it disorganizes. So the organizations like AMREF, Save the Children, we have World Vision, we have CARE, mention, mention them. So these came in to make these negotiations and it is from that we saw to it that there was some change. They did not only come in before, but even during the time when uh, there was uh, a real, real chaos between the top administrators and the government. Now, we are saying that there is a negotiation that took place even during this uh, nine, two, 2009, there was a riot whereby everyone who belongs to the kingdom of Buganda decided to lose it. You know, enough is enough. If it is war, let us do it. If we use stones, let us do it. Oh. Now, among the things during that uh, influence on its actual administration, the Buganda or the Buganda Kingdom were, was demanding federal kind of administration. It wanted to be in charge of its territory, but it was not something that was going to be so simple because even up to now, I believe many of you here, especially those who come from the countries nearby, Uganda, that is Kenya, uh, talk of Tanzania, talk of Sudan, or South Sudan, DRC, you know very well that when you're talking about Buganda, you talk about the Kabaka. And the Kabaka, it's as if has more powers in fact, you can see this sometimes via media that uh, when uh, the Kabaka, the king goes through, goes through the kingdom or goes through the territory of Buganda, people enjoy it. They get excited. They leave their shops and do whatever. But when it is time for the president to do the same, things are different. Now, in the contemporary Africa, we can say that reality, there is, this is a reality that numerous evolving states uh, that have to grapple with the inevitability of conflict on their own, the fledging institutions in these states cannot cope with the huge demands unleashed by everyday conflicts. These everyday conflicts call for a hand and if this hand comes from the traditional leaders, whoever is in charge. And it is within this context that the complementary, sorry, the complementarities on between traditional institutions and the modern states become not only observable but also imperative. So it is desirable that they come in and the play a part. When we talk about these uh, traditional African societies playing a part as, a, as far as this uh, mediation is concerned, we need to know that they have a role. They influence, really. Because, like I've just said, traditional leaders are given much Traditional leaders are given much attention if you compare them to the civil leaders. Okay, because of time, uh, let me rush through this. Uh, okay, I was saying that while traditional institutions are rooted in the culture and the history of African societies, the modern state exerts a large amount of influence on these institutions. For example, sometimes uh, if they realize that they need to go the other way, they bring in, like, they politicize, politicize, they propagate. This is when they need to use them in that case. In other cases, 
especially where they express dissent with the state, the traditional institutions have often been undermined. Why? Because if they are given, if they are given this uh, autonomy to go ahead and mediate, things come out and they are the ones shining instead of the big guns. Uh, then when we talk of conflict management in Uganda, this has been centered on traditional laws and customs. These laws and customs depended on the reliance on, on the parties. The individual or his or her family owed the duty of care to each other and to the community. Talk about the individual enjoyed certain rights and uh, was protected. Then, if an individual was maybe guilty, then the punishments that are being given in this case are given by those close family members, not anybody outside it. As if that is not enough, no urge of having to rely on other external forces to dispense discipline. That is as far as uh, uh, mediation comes in in that context. Then compensation and fines which were expressed in tangible goods and recognized community services. Sometimes when you are found guilty of a certain crime, then you may be asked to do community work. We call it Blunji 1C. So you can come in maybe to help clean the place or the city or anything within the same, the same, same, same territory. Then there was also nurturing various fictional but effective remedy. You can look at oaths. You could take an oath during this mediation. Or curses were, were to be maybe casted on you if at all something went wrong and you didn't do it your way. So you were obliged to follow something because if I don't do this, in, in, the, normal, in the normal world of religion, we talk about God, but in that sense we talk about those uh, spirits that we can't see and we fear much than even God sometimes as far as some societies are concerned. Uh, we have taboos. We have these also ritual sacrifices. Uh, for example, in those ritual sacrifices, these included like uh, some could cut uh, apart, eh? uh, coffee bean, and then share it you take piece of it, I take piece of it, we bring, we have peace uh, between, between each other and that is it. These were intended to supplement the enforcement mechanism of the law and obeyed by those Ganda they applied. Then another issue also concerning that we had the confinement of disputes and their settlement among us, the immediate parties and their families have hinted on that. Then communication in traditional Africa meant getting news around and this took many forms. Some could use horns, calling them such that something has to be shared among the, the populace. Storytelling, drumming, proverbs, use of signs and even by use of mouth. How this communication was done like we have said, drumming. Sometimes we could use a small to signal that something is happening, so we call for people to come and uh, mediate, share something together, y using songs of say, use of rituals like sharing coffee beans, uh, the use of evening fire. Through this, we could uh, find that peace prevailed among those. But like I've said, today in the current world or generation or in, pr in the present, it is very hard for people to look at traditional leaders as a, a source of uh, 
mediation or better mediation. Why sometimes, even if they command respect, even if they are respected so much, they take the other way around to go in for the law, lawyers, police, etc. In conclusion, the dynamic nature of society makes conflicts unavailable. However, we cannot avoid conflict. We can try to manage it by dealing with it in a way that shows due respect to human dignity and the committee rights. Thank you for listening. May God bless you. Mungu Aibariki Aisam.